So hello, everybody. I am sitting here with Christopher Rocchio. Christopher is a science fiction author and also an editor. He has written a series. He's working on a series called The Sun Eater in science fiction. I've not read his work, but I've seen him around. He's been talking with people that, uh, with Nicholas Kotar, and he's written a few emails. And he brought up a subject which I find very fascinating. He wrote me an email uh, about a few, a few months ago about the possibility of heavy metal being an apotropaic practice, which is that heavy metal could actually be something which would be uh, the kind of practices people would use to kind of uh, frighten the devil or to push away evil things. And so I got really uh, fascinated by that because I, it had crossed my mind a while ago. And so I was hoping to see if he could make the case for it. And so we'll see if he could do that. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. All right, so Christopher, maybe you can start just by telling us a bit about yourself, a little bit about uh, the kind of projects you're working on, and uh, we can ease into our conversation. Yeah, sure. So I've been writing since I was, I think, in second grade. I was uh, one of those kids who never developed social skills or the ability to play football. Um, and so I've, I've been working on some version of the story that eventually became The Sun Eater uh, since then. Um, I went to school for classics and for English rhetoric at NC State here in North Carolina. And uh, I sold my book series like uh, two weeks after graduation, and I've been working wow. on that ever since. Yep. <laughs> Uh, really fortunate with the timing. Um, and then I also, uh, I work as an assistant editor at uh, Bain Books. They're a science fiction fantasy publisher, uh, the largest independent uh, science fiction publisher, I think, in the English-speaking world. Uh, we're not owned by Simon & Schuster or one of the big ones. Okay. Um, and I also, I'm also a, a metal music fan, uh, which is why uh, I was watching the 666 video. And uh, I think you were talking about uh, 666, not as a dark symbol, but as a light one, and that being something that metal community gets wrong, I was like, okay, all right. And then you described uh, Ozzy Osbourne as a satanic figure, and I was like, well, hold on. Um, <laughs> and I sent, you, uh, I sent you an email that I was really embarrassed about, because I usually don't do that sort of thing, like I was saying before, the, before we started recording. Um, and uh, so this is just something that gets said a lot uh, about metal music, and it just, um, and it's something that gets said too, even about, about my work, because there's, a real tendency to confuse symbols with um, with their context, right? Um, and uh, my main character is, uh, the, the book series is set in the distant future, about 20,000 years out, and his family symbol is, uh, is a devil, um, which had been kind of a, a metal music joke when I, when I chose it. And there is a real question in the story about whether or not he's good or evil, and there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of play there because it is. Uh, I guess I should talk about the books briefly. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's. Uh, I was a big Star Wars fan growing up. It's part of the reason I. Um, I never uh, developed social skills. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's. Uh, it's that sort of space opera. Only instead of a galaxy, you know, far, far away, long ago, it's our distant future. And he. I like to say he's like Anakin Skywalker. His becoming Darth Vader were his best possible option. Uh, he tells you page one. Uh, that he is the person who ended this war between humanity and these aliens, um, and that he killed all of them. And the story is why and how um, it's written as a memoir. And so there's a lot of stuff that people don't know and a lot of propaganda that he's trying to unpack. And he may be inserting his own uh, twist uh, on the story as well. And he might not, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit about who I am and, and how all of this gets tied together and why I'm here. Okay. All right. So now here comes the here comes the the case that you've got to make for me, which is, okay. uh, I, look, I, I I'm serious that I I have thought about this before because I, you know, when I started to think symbolically, I started to realize that a lot of things it's just with the place that they have. It's usually that's the problem with things. And so I was trying to ask myself a question like what what would be the place of different things, and then when I thought about heavy metal, I had this vision of like John the Baptist, right? Of John the Baptist, like standing in the desert and like screaming, telling people like repent, the end is near. 
all that stuff you know he's 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 got this like he's got the natty hair and he's eating locusts and so he's he's kind of like this mar this crazy marginal figure who don't know you don't know if he's insane or not and he's uh and he's yelling and he's like telling people he's like telling people they're sinners and he's accusing and he's doing all that stuff and so i thought okay well that seems like in the best of worlds that that's what heavy metal could be like every heavy metal could do that right so anyway so so now you have to make your case and and tell me why you think it serves that function well i i do think i do think that it does and so i guess before i could say anything about heavy metal i should just acknowledge that there are affirmatively satanic bands okay uh, and there are neo-pagan ones and there are generally occult ones and that does represent a large sort of vector of the community but it didn't start that way um it's hard to pinpoint where heavy metal exactly comes from as a genre um some people will say that it was black sabbath some people will go uh earlier than that um some people even point to like just the way that Jimi hendrix played the guitar right? mm-hmm. it's, it's a little bit heavier than than others i like the black sabbath choice just because it so clearly gets um most of the features of metal music in in in, in one band right mm-hmm. And for them, um, they, they also sort of uh, steal credit, or not steal credit, but take credit um, in no small part just because of the, the themes they were dealing with. Um, their Black Sabbath, along with Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple, were usually sometimes called the unholy trinity of metal music. But there's nothing really, there's nothing really unholy about a lot of their work. Sabbath's the only one that really deals with occult symbolism in, in any great detail. The others will touch on it from time to time, but um, you know, Led Zeppelin's much more like traditional rock and roll. They've got some fantasy themes going on um, with a lot of like, Tolkien references and whatnot, and and Vikings' immigrant song obviously being about Valhalla and about Viking. Uh, but it doesn't really start to take the satanic turn until a bit later. Sabbath named themselves after a uh, a horror movie, a Boris Karloff film, I think from '63 or '64. Um, and that's what they wanted to be. They wanted to do horror films, but as rock songs. And they wanted to recreate that feeling of dread. And horror is a very moral genre, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you did all the monster videos, right? And and so horror films are very rarely, you know, some modern ones are, very, but they're very rarely on the side of the monster. Yeah. And a lot of those songs aren't either. There's a song, uh, uh, Lord of the World, on I think uh, Master of Reality, their third album. That's sung from Satan's point of view, but it's about the cost of selling one's soul, right? And so Ozzy plays this demonic character on the stage, and the band sort of backs up that demonic feel to it. But the the message of the song is is don't do this, right? Uh, You turn to me in all your worldly greed and pride, but will you turn to me when it's your time to die? And the answer is no. Uh, Most people don't. They uh, they don't. Um, They you know as as they die, they call out usually for God stereotypically, right? um, you made me master of the world, this world where you exist, you know, which is, uh, I mean, Lord of the World is one of Satan's monikers, right? And, but it doesn't take that attitude toward, towards it. They actually um, were so tired of being called a satanic band that the second song on, uh, on that same album, uh, After Forever, is affirmatively Christian. It's uh, reminding people to watch out for their souls. Um, they were just sick of seeing it in the press all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you know, that doesn't mean, uh, again, that doesn't mean that these bands don't exist, but uh, it's interesting to note things like that because um, uh, another great example is the, the horns gesture, right, that yeah. everyone sees. Uh, was There's some dispute as to who started it. Gene Simmons uh, claims that it was him, you know, a basis for Kiss, but apparently Gene claims to have invented everything. Uh, he owns the patent on, on OJ, the, the abbreviation. Uh, so he, he, people use that. He, he just he he claims a lot of things. Interesting guy, but it uh, belongs, I think, really to Ronnie James Dio, who uh, was with Rainbow. He was and uh, he was with Black Sabbath. I replaced Ozzy actually, um, and he was uh, from an old Italian family. And his grandmother used to do that, you know, to ward the evil eye off or to put the evil eye onto someone. And so what's so interesting to me is the way that metal misuses so many symbols or. It, uh, in the community, right? People use that thinking, oh yeah, you know, we're demons. But Dio in interviews would be very forthright in saying that this was a symbol 
um, to ward off evil. I mean, he uses it in weird times when he's performing, usually when he mentions the devil, like he's trying to, to both portray him and keep him away, like he's a gargoyle in that moment, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of his songs, too, aren't about, um, you know, they aren't affirmatively satanic so much as, as warning people about uh, different things, very often social ills, right? Like, uh, he has a famous song called Don't Talk to Strangers, and it's about that simple, you know, just don't do it uh, because they're dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, in that moment, is sort of playing the role of the, the fox from Pinocchio, right? You know, um, threatening, mm-hmm. threatening the audience. Right, so it's kind of, so they are inhabiting these dark forces, but in a way they're doing it to kind of scare people off. It, yeah, at, at least, least where the genre is. begins, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, again, that's not to say there aren't bands, like I think you cited Cannibal Corpse in one of your videos, <laughs> and those guys are insane. I, I, I don't, uh, I think they have a song called My House is Full of Skulls, and it turned out that actually one of them had a whole bunch of actual human bones in his house. Um yeah. I do not claim to be a fan of that band. I understand that some people are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't. Uh, don't get it. Yeah. Well, it seems like the thing when I when when I listen to you speak, uh, I think that there's something to understand. At least there's something to understand in terms of apotropaic symbolism. And so, so apotropaic symbolism. I anybody who's watched my videos, you've 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 seen it. I've talked about gargoyles. I've talked about the monster on the edge. The monster on the edge who's there, who's one of his functions is to protect you from the bigger monster. And so, you know, you, you have a, you have a uh, let's say, Cerberus between the world of the living and the world of the dead. He's this scary three-headed monster. But his purpose is to guard that, that uh, transition so that bigger monsters from Hades don't come up and devour the world, you know. And so the, the, the thing about this type of symbolism is exactly the, the problem that you seem to be talking about, which is it, it, it's, um, it's, it works. Like it's a symbolism that works, but it also can be a symbolism that's dangerous yeah. because of that problem. And the example that I give is an example which has nothing to, which is maybe more political and people can understand it better is that you can imagine, let's say uh, an empire, Roman empire, they're being attacked by, nomadic tribes and these nomadic tribes they have all these fighting techniques and they have all these arm these weapons and this way of, of being that, that the romans don't know how to deal with so they're the ultimate stranger they're they're being strange and the romans can't tame them so they're coming in they're destroying roman cities they're doing all that so the romans decide well okay so what do we what should we do and obviously the only solution is hire these people or hire some of these people to then fight the the to fight off the other nomads and so you do that. So you hire the barbarian to, f- to fight the barbarian and it works. But then there's always a dangerous line that you cross, which is that if you bring the barbarian in too much, you never know when the barbarian is going to turn back on you and then devour you. And so you get the barbarians to fight off the other barbarians. But by the, you know, by the, Fifth century, sixth century, Rome is barbarian, and and all has been taken over by the very people they tried to use to fight off the other barbarians. Right, and I think there's a real danger with that in, in the genre. Just, um, I mean, that's part of how it it has shifted culturally, right? Especially in a pagan direction. I think that's really metal's sort of more organizing principle in this tent because so much of it's produced in Scandinavia. And the Scandinavian countries are turning towards, you know, some form of neo-paganism, although, you know, there's not really any continuity with the old, the old tradition in any all way. Up. I was, all I was so up. glad when you said that, because I make that joke uh, all the time. I, I was talking to a friend's mother at a wedding, and she was talking about being a Greek pagan and worshipping uh, uh, Dionysus, and I asked her if she'd sacrificed a bull uh, at the equinox and put on a play, and she did not know what I was talking about. Um, and, what, is it, uh, sp- what is it called? Sp- the, the, in, the, in the play where they rip the animals apart with their bare hands, you know, no. in uh, Spagmatos know or something, something like that. Yeah, I don't know. But the, <laughs> I wonder if the Dionysian people do that. I, if they don't, they're faking it. I know. So, <laughs> but there is, there is a tendency, I think, just because people are around those symbols, I think they're attractive in, in 
in certain ways and that pulls people in weird directions because there there are bands who don't get right that that even they don't they don't get when the older bands or certain bands are doing um or employing these symbols apotropaically they may uh they, they may just go all in because it's loud and it's noisy and it upsets their parents yeah. uh, i actually don't know if ozzy osbourne knows uh that a lot of those earlier songs are apotropaic yeah um, well, one of the things too is that these people, like I, I'm sorry to say this, but a lot of the people aren't the smartest, like they're not the smartest people. And so yeah. I don't think, and they're not the most aware people. So I don't think that even someone like Ozzy Osbourne necessarily understood the things he was doing when he was doing them. You know, that's, if, that's if some, true. yeah, so, so if some of the things he was doing was playing this apotropaic uh, function, I'm not sure he was totally aware. I'm not also sure it was to the benefit of his own soul, if you know what I mean. I, I think that's true. I um I will say though he didn't really write those songs. Mm-hmm. Um, he got a disproportionate amount of credit for writing the early Black Sabbath songs because his wife was their manager's daughter, and she's worked very hard to sort of uh, twist the history of that band in particular. Mm-hmm. If you go on Black Sabbath's Twitter account to this day, you will see no sign of the other five singers they had. Okay. Um, they're never mentioned. Um, including Dio, who was the the next one, and um, Geezer Butler, who was the bassist, wrote most of the lyrics to those older songs. He wrote Iron Man, he wrote War Pigs, he wrote uh, Paranoid and uh, NIB, and all those earlier songs that get most that get replayed the most. Yeah, and he was uh, from an Irish Catholic family, and uh, Tony Iommi, who's the guitarist, who really is Black Sabbath. Um, it was from an Italian Catholic family. I don't know the degree to which they're practicing, but it's clearly an influence on their writing in a way that I just don't think that Ozzy is aware of. Um, and they'll, they're the ones who'll tell you in interviews, right, that, you know, like, this isn't, you know, we're not a satanic band, right? Like, we're trying to tell horror stories and to scare mm-hmm. people. Now, they may not be aware of apotropaic, you know, magic or practices generally, but they at least know that they're not a satanic band, right? Enough to enough to write a Christian song on their third record just to... What was, I don't know, I'm not a fan of any metal, but what was that song about? Like, what you said it was a Christian uh, song. It was, um, it's called After Forever, and it's about, um, it, it, it's, it's reminding the audience to um, maybe think about religion. It's, uh, have you ever thought about your soul? Can it be saved? Or do you think when you go away, you'll just go in the grave? Um, and it's reminding them that these things are actually real. And maybe you should uh, you should actually spend some time thinking about it. Uh, there's a point in it where they ask uh, like what your what are your feelings about uh, papism, right? Uh, are you you know an Anglican or not? Or um, and and a lot of more specific questions like that. But it, it basically comes down on you should be paying attention to these parts of, of reality and 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 whatnot. Um, and they're not alone in this either. I, I'm picking on Black Sabbath a lot because it's the one that you mentioned. Um, but there are bands like Striper who um, are very explicitly Christian bands. Um, that's all they, they write about. They've got, I can't remember which, I, a verse from Isaiah is all stamped on every one of their, uh, their, yeah, yeah, their, yeah. their, their records. Um, the one about Stripes, right? Um, I can't remember. I, I wouldn't know, but I just remember the image. I have the glam, the glam band. It was in the glam band moment when they had all the long hair and the makeup and yeah, okay, wearing, no, like these about. uniforms with stripes on them. Man, I could just never, I, even when I was like 13, 14, there were, it was really, a lot of people were into that stuff. And I was just like, I just can't. They look ridiculous, but <laughs> they're, they, they can play. I tell you, um, but they did uh, their last album. There was a, a, a song on it called Yahweh that was like a, a power metal epic about about God direct, directly. Right? It wasn't there wasn't any layer of metaphor because usually in popular culture, if you're going to be Christian to any degree and and get away with it, it seems like you have to put it under layers of uh, a, of a protective clothing, as it were, yeah. in order to make it palatable to people. And there are some heavy metal guys. Like I know, I, was, I think who was it that converted? Actually, that became like an evangelical. Um. Well, Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper, right? Yeah. He um. He teaches Bible study, um, <laughs> which is amazing, right? Because he's Alice Cooper. But like all the stories about him, uh, you know, selling his soul for talent, right? He tells these things because it's a performance, right? There's a story about him killing a chicken on stage 
I was just telling my coworker about this yesterday, um, where um, they, they said that he beheaded one on stage. But what happened is one had wandered in. It was like an outdoor performance, some fair or something. And he tried to shoo it off the stage and it flapped away and fell into the stands and people crushed it. And so the newspaper said the next day, you know, this, you know, terrible Satanist performer beheaded a chicken on stage. And Frank Zappa apparently called him and asked if he really did that. And he's like, well, of course I didn't do that. Why would I kill a chicken? And he's like, well, if anyone asks, say you did, right? You know, it's, it's your business. <laughs> and and so, so he, he, you know, he, he just played that straight. But he, um, I think he had a problem with alcoholism and, and uh, turned around sometime in like the 70s and has been uh, devoutly religious ever since. I think he was I think he was a preacher's kid, actually, when he was yeah. growing up. I think he's a Baptist or, or something, but he's not alone either. Um, Blackie Lawless, who's uh, the lead singer for Wasp, which was uh, like a real big, you know, party, you know, shock rock band throwing raw meat into the stands. Yeah, because th there's also like a degenerate line in the heavy metal like the motley crew and all them like where it was all about being completely degenerate like it yeah, wasn't the was... violent like the violent imagery of black sabbath or metallica or all those bands it was more like just the being a complete degenerate wasp is archetypally one of those yeah um they used to pretend to torture women on stage and it just it just to sort of out you know as as performance art and, he, and even, even when he was in the middle of that he, he seemed weirdly sane to me in interviews as I'll watch old interviews and he'll be like, well, it's just, you know, the violence that we're seeing the world and I'm trying to reflect it to say something about you. So I think there's this, this thread of social critique that's still there, mm -hmm. even when it's like way too far for, you know, for my sensibilities. Right. And his last album was a concept piece about the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. um, and it's played in the same musical style, but he's completely swung around. I think nine 11, really did a number on him, if I remember his story, right? Okay. Just psychologically, he couldn't believe that this was the world he was living in because he was a New Yorker. And, um, well, there's something about that, like when you said, because if if you think about it, there's, you know, like the, the Passion of Christ, the Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson is like a heavy metal movie. Oh, yeah. Like that whole aesthetic, like the whole brutality of it, uh, you know, I you know, when I was, I remember watching it and thinking something similar. It's like, this is something about this, which is about kind of scaring you and disgusting you and, you know, shocking you into understanding how, how serious this is. Yeah. What I think part of that is, is that the world we inhabit now is so sanitized, right? That getting any of it, however, over the top and fake, and maybe the over the topness is a necessary feature of this because it really has to like wake people up. Uh, I think it speaks to a, a capacity maybe that some people just don't experience in their daily lives anymore. And so they go looking, it's like, uh, it's like thrill seeking, right? It's like uh, people who go skydiving or something it helps them maybe uh, experience the world in a, in a more full sense, although maybe, <laughs> maybe they're going about it in the wrong way in some, in some places, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I think, I mean, I think you're right. Like the way to, I think the way to understand it's the same for all for horror movies uh you know it's like i don't i don't think people should watch horror movies i i really think it's 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 bad for you but it's for someone who's lost and can't feel or doesn't understand you know the the imminence of death you know i can understand why they would want it to, to see that in order to shock themselves into to kind of just feeling that or to understanding that this is a imminent reality of this is an imminent part of our reality um and to see it's like a kind of extreme version most of horror movies seem to be just extreme morality plays like extreme versions of of sin and punishment you know they yeah. kind of try to deconstruct that in the more recent movies but that seems to be it yeah well there's something about that in, in like the way that, that greek tragedies work too right is, is that the characters are punished for their violation of some uh essential moral law right like in uh, in the Oresteia, right? Uh, uh, Clytemnestra punishes Agamemnon for killing Iphigenia, but then that creates this whole cycle that has to go back and forth until finally, uh, with Athena, they're able to synthesize some sort of new law to break that that cycle. But the characters are serially punished for their transgression. Yeah, um, and it's something Shakespeare does too. Um, 
you know, to choose another another more classic example. All of the characters in Shakespeare that have sex outside of marriage die, mm-hmm. um, usually terribly. Um, and it's because there's a violation of that moral law there. And horror movies do that in a really sort of maximal way. And I think that the visual language and the sound of heavy metal tries to cash in on some of that. I think, uh, and I think very consciously, because I think that's what, um, especially the earlier bands were trying to do. I think some of them have lost the plot, like we're talking about, and have gone further down uh, various avenues trying to cash in on uh, that shock factor, because that's what, you know, brings people in. Um, but I do think it's it's to try and, uh, I think it's in part to try and make people feel something. Mm. Uh, and yeah, and there's something that, about uh, when you said about the Greek tragedy, I find I find that you're you seem to be right on in the sense that my in my perception of this is also to as we watch Christianity kind of um, erode in society, we're seeing the ancient tropes come back. You know, because the let's say the whatever a horror movie can give you, traditionally in a Christian church, you would get that during Holy Week. Like that's what holy one of the things Holy Week was for was to bring you right up against that insanity, right? To bring you right up against that insanity. Understand that you are the one doing it to Christ. Understand that Christ is calling you to be the victim at the same time. It was kind of like synthesizing the whole question of the the you know the the murderer and the victim and the the the, the sinful but sinless. It was like this crazy capacity to bring all those threads together into one moment which is the the crucifixion and we participated in it every year and so it seems like as we and you know at, and that also replaced even the you know the 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 gladi- gladiatorial fights the people killing themselves in the arena for our pleasure all of that kind of went away as we had the crucifixion as the ultimate version of all these violent threads kind of coming into this one moment um, but as we watch Christianity erode, we're seeing all of it come back. Like we're seeing, uh, you know, the cage fighting and all this stuff, watching people beat each other. Um, and also the ex- the extremity of the Greek, um, this kind of Greek drama of of, uh, of people getting ripped apart, all the stuff that we saw in Greek tragedy, we're seeing it again in these horror movies and in these things. And so um, in the best in the best world, like in the best way, they can still be they can still be a little thread towards Christ. Like they can still have a little thread where you can still use those moments, use those extremes, and try to help people see, you know, all of this thing that you're dealing with, all of these feelings, all of these uh situations that you're attracted to, they all culminate in the crucifixion. Like that's there, you can't beat that story in terms of bringing it all together into one into one story. Totally. I think I think you're right on because I think a lot of uh, a lot of the symbolic power in in the music, for instance, uh, comes from the fact that a lot of these symbols are appropriated from uh, especially the Catholic Church. The amount of Catholic symbolism in the metal scene, however twisted around or mm. placed out of context, is is enormous. There's an extremely popular band called Ghost, um, and the, the lead singer dresses as a Catholic bishop. Um, but he paints a skull on his face, and all of his crosses are upside down. And don't get me started on the upside down cross thing. Um, <laughs> talking about symbols being misused, that one kills me in every horror movie and every metal performance. Um, but he dresses, he dresses as a bishop, right? Yeah. And all of their stage backdrops are stained glass windows that have, you know, the album covers. And it actually, I was at an Iron Maiden show um, last summer. And all of their backdrops on the stage were stained glass windows, right? And and um, and so it's interesting how much liturgical symbolism is is appropriated and misused. And I think it's because there is this. I mean, you hear this all the time, right? The West has no culture, right? Um, Christianity is no culture. Well, these things get repeated all the time. But it obviously does. And yeah. I think it's just that it's, you know, moved so much out of people's vision for whatever reason. I think possibly because uh, a lot of Protestants, especially in America, have an icon problem. They just, mm-hmm. they won't look at them. They won't, their churches are, you know, old hotels. Yeah. Um, but there's so much of that's been stripped away. 
that I think the music, by using these symbols, catches a lot of young people and, and is like, actually, this stuff does exist, and we're going to use it to be cool and edgy, and they use it badly, right? And they use it, you know, I think, to different ends, right? Yeah, well, it's an upside down. It's an apotropaic thing. It's an upside right. down. It's a carnival. It's all the symbolism that when I talk about the upside down world, the clown world, all of it, that's what it is. It, you know, like you said, the, the upside down cross, you know, it's like it, there is a positive version of the upside down cross, which is the cross of St. Peter. But there's also, you know, you're, you're, you're not super smart. I mean, and you're like, well, I have this thing I want to that I that I I love hate this love hate relationship. I have with this thing. And so I'm going to use all the imagery, but I'm going to just turn this thing upside down. It's like a really simple gesture to just say, like I'm making and putting it upside down. Right. And, and, and here I am putting everything upside down. Uh, you know, the key, the key for us, at least now in this moment in culture is to, to now to, to, to play the, the last trick on them, which is to flip that back up, like to, to, to take the upside down as it really is presented and flip it back. I think that that's the, that's the, that's the last trick. I kind of joke about that with St. Christopher too. It's the last, it's the last trick. It's the last inversion. It's the, the, the inversion of the inversion or whatever. Um, and so all these, especially now with like all these people who love metal, for example, who actually Christianity is so eroded that they have all these metal symbols. They don't even know what they refer to in terms of their own culture. They just have the upside down version. Yeah, so I have a funny story about this because there's a meme that goes around on like Imager and Red from time to time uh, about a band called Malact, which I'm probably mispronouncing. They're a Swedish uh, black metal band who started researching uh, Catholic theology in order to better uh, blaspheme. <laughs> And they researched so much that they converted to Catholicism. Uh, and they have written... <laughs> it's we can't blaspheme it. anymore because we don't even know what we're doing. We got to learn what we're doing in order to blaspheme. And then it's just like, whoop, whoop. That's hilarious. And they still write black metal, but it's, it's, uh, it's Catholic now. Catholic uh, was, black metal. They're, very, they're fairly obscure. And I think the only time they ever get mentioned is in the context of this new story about them trying to blaspheme better and then converting. Um, I've, I've never really seen people talk about them that much, but they do exist. And that, that final flip did happen locally in their case. Mm -hmm. um, but they, yeah, I was reading an interview with them a couple of days ago where they were, as I was trying to get ready, right, and I, uh, to talk to you. <laughs> and I wanted to mention this because it's so funny. Um, but they were talking about how, you know, uh, they're talking about the divine darkness and how uh, that is, you know, uh, it's pretty metal, right? And, it's and pretty how metal. It, it might turn to light, you know, once you, you know, or where, you, you know, you come into the fullness of Christ, right? But it's dark outside of it, which is, you know, where perhaps many of our listeners are. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot so black metal is still very appropriate for what we're doing, right? Um, <laughs> and now I will say that's not my preferred genre of metal. Uh, yeah. it, it's, you know, uh, it's not very hospitable. Uh, to someone with my worldview, but it is so fascinating to me that that happened. That is, I mean, that's exactly what you would think. Like that's exactly, it's almost like a, it's a story that you would read in a, in a short story almost. It, it, it seems so perfect, you know? Yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so now, so now you let, tell us a little bit about your, your journey. Cause you've been on, been on quite a journey, I guess, in the past few years related to this and to your own writing and your own life and spiritual journey? Yeah, so I'm one of those people that Jordan Peterson talks about, um, you know, helping. Um, I, uh, I was born Catholic, I uh, raised Catholic, and I, uh, my grandparents all died in the same year hmm. um, through unrelated circumstances when I was about 13. Whoa. Um, and it was, it was just really hard. Um, it was, it was a really big, you know, personal tragedy for anyone to go through. And that really sort of shook my, uh, shook my religious convictions. And I combined that with going to the high school, right. And I moved from a Catholic school to a public one. And there's just a lot of things going on. Hmm. And so I, I ended up with like the secular student Alliance when I was in college and I had dinner with Richard Dawkins. Whoa. Uh, and not, not a very personal one. It was like a big, you know, club banquet. Yeah. So I might have had 10 words with him. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, the sort of place I was in. 
And for whatever reason, um, I found Jordan Peterson stuff right before the C16 stuff really hit. Um, so I was I was in on the ground floor on that, and I I watched everything because uh, it was just I, I've always liked the psychology stuff. I was going to be a psychologist. Um, I changed my mind right when I got to college because uh, I realized there was not much money in it unless I wanted to be an academic or an actual psychiatrist in med school. <laughs> and so I thought I'd rather write stories, which is what I was doing. Anyway. Yeah, because you make a lot of money doing that usually. Most people usually, make so much money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was a kid. Uh, and, and I will <laughs> say, in my defense, it's worked out okay. Yeah, there you go. Um, so that's that's good. But I, um, uh, his Bible series in particular, really did a, did a number on me. And so thank you for your part in that. I I wouldn't necessarily know where to put myself. I said before the call, right? I, I'm maybe in the narthex still. Um, I do know that I don't really like the anti-theist crowd that much anymore. Uh, I didn't really like them when I was with them. That was mm. a, uh, seemed, to me, seemed to me to be very unhappy. I know I was. Uh, I don't mean to speak for everybody, but it was not a very like friendly environment. There was a lot of political tension there too um, that I just didn't, I didn't find comfortable. They were so interested in activism, mm. which I always felt was a weird choice. But uh, when I started, I was writing all the way through this. And what's really strange to me uh, it, uh, about the book in particular is that when I wrote the first draft, I was still pretty much in the Richard Dawkins camp. Mm. And then as I revised it, as I was revising it, I was going through all these personal changes. And so the book's written as a memoir by a character who's about 1,500 years old because it's science fiction. And his 19-year-old self thinks a lot like me pre revision and the right. narrator who is narratizing the uh the whole story tends to think like post uh post trauma me uh po you know post i won't say conversion because it's more a journey home than anything but um and so there's some weird dialogue between the two versions of the character that i think has a lot to do with my my personal evolution um the plot's the same uh you know the uh, but it's it's funny because I'll get some readers who will be like, "Wow, this book is really anti-religious," and there are other readers like I have a friend, I have a couple of friends who are Catholic priests who've read it, and they're like, "No, it's not." Uh, <laughs> and so people come away with different ideas about. It. I think it's one of the things interesting about stories, in the same way that you know a painting or an icon might say more um, than a, a description of it. I think stories can do more than one thing at once. Yeah. Wow, so, that's interesting. So now, so you're, in, you said you're now you're, you feel like you're kind of on, you're on a journey home, I guess, or you're kind of in the, in the narthex in between. Yeah, I, I'm really struggling. I'd still, I think I'm stuck in the same place that, or one of the same places that Peterson seems to be said, where I don't know what believe means. Um, because I, I don't, I don't, this is a really tricky conversation to have, right? And I don't know what people mean when they say that, and I don't know what they mean when they say they feel the presence of, of divinity or any of these things. I do know that I, the people who are religious seem happier to me, the ones that I know at least. What was really interesting to me is my fiance, I'm getting married on Saturday. Congratulations, um, by the way. Thank you. Uh, was a Baptist, but she'd sort of slipped from any sort of practice in college as, as many millennials do and she was having a pretty rough time of it and i um i mentioned not really wanting to send my kids to public school because public schools make me nervous mm. having been to one um and that i you know if we had any maybe catholic school would be worth doing and she told me she went home to miami she was um she was in school there at the time she told me she'd just gone to RCAA, an RCAA meeting, and she was going to convert. And I had not put that into her head in any way mm. as, that I know of. But she went through, um, she went through and got confirmed and, and uh, at First Communion and all that. Whoa. And that seems to have been because of my influence in some way. Um, I don't know how, but that's also kind of telling because also, you know, uh, in in. In, in a lot of the biblical stories, women seem to catch these things first. Mm -hmm. So I'm just sort of trying to feel out what, 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 what I, what I feel, what I believe. Mm. 
and what that means. And I'm trying right. to figure it out. Um, Are you being married by a priest? I am. Yeah, right. same priest who married my parents. I, you know, so it's it's an interesting thing. I don't really know what to make of it. Um, and and so I I I. I Again, this is a difficult conversation to have. I'm just oh, sort yeah. of, I'm just sort of waiting to see what happens. Mm. Um, hopefully, not too long, because there's that overtold story about the three boats and the flooding house, um, and I, I don't want to drown. Um, yeah. But I, I I don't quite know where I am, and I'm worried that if I rush into something, that I'll have a reaction like I did when I was a kid. Because some, for whatever reason, I just seem to be contrary. Yeah. Um, wherever I am, I, I push back. Uh, when I was, uh, you know, a kid and I was religious, I had all these questions. I quit confirmation class midway through. Yeah. Um, and maybe I, do you want me to give you a? Uh, I'll give you an idea, maybe, or a little, sure. a little tip or something. That I think that the I think that when you're in the position that you are and you don't know what it means to believe and you don't know exactly what it means to um, believe in God, I would say that the best way to deal with that is to, um, is to be grateful, is to thank God. And it more than to see it, because Jordan, one of the problems with Jordan is that he says, I act as if God exists. And for him, that means I try to live a moral life and I try to do what's right. But that's not the first thing. That's The first thing is, to 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 see the goodness in your life, to see the goodness in your relationship with your fiance, to see the love that she has for you, and to see the the you know the the moments where people are manifesting something more to you, you know uh, some generosity, some love, some affection, and to thank God for that. And then I think that if you do that and you're going to start to see maybe what it means to, to believe in God because believing God is more of a, is more of a, a, a positioning yourself in life. It's more of a direction in which you're facing more than a mental game that you play with your, you know, with your thoughts or whatever that you believe in this or you know, like, what does it even mean to, I'm not even sure what it means to, to totally just say like, I don't believe it me it's the opposite like i don't know what it means when someone says i don't believe in god i'm like what are you talking about you don't <laughs> believe in god like okay you don't believe in a god maybe like what god do you not believe in i'd like to know because i'm talking about the infinite source of all being i'm talking about that which is both being and non-being that is both beyond existence you know i was reading saint maximus just now in uh in uh, the uh, ecclesiastical mystagogy uh, mystagogy and he basically says, he's like, oh, on the one hand, we can say God does not exist. On the other hand, we can say God exists because God is not a, a being in, this, in the sense of, a, of, a, of like you or he, right. is, he is beyond all existence. So when someone says, I don't believe in God, or even when they say, I believe in God, I'm like, well, what do you mean even when you say you believe in God? Like, what level, at what level are you talking about here? Um, so I would say that that's probably not the most important thing. Like it, it's, it's mostly about, I think, gratitude and then looking at the story of Christ and seeing how that story can be transformative in, in your life because it's the, it's the ultimate story. Well, I have been thinking about that last one a fair bit just because stories are what I do. Right? Mm. And the degree to which, you know, the Christ story uh, relates to things like Campbell's Hero's Journey, and it, it, it is the best version of that, right? And and so I, I thank you, um, I guess. <laughs> I guess. We'll see. We'll talk in a few years and see how, how, how's it go, how it's going. Yeah, so it's just been a really interesting couple of years for me in that regard. Hmm. Um, and so, gosh, I really don't know what to say about that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, it is, it's, uh, it's a very difficult personal conversation. Um, hmm. yeah, well, I really do appreciate all that. No, oh, it's, it's it, thanks for sharing that with us as well. And, and I mean, I, it's like just one step at a time, you know, just, you just move slowly, you're getting married. That's the biggest thing you've got. And so, you know, hopefully you'll also see the presence of God in your, 
in your relationship, you know, and that's something that you can see as well. I think if I'm going to see it anywhere, maybe there. There you, know, you go. Uh, gratitude definitely be a theme for the last week and for the rest of this one, I should think. Awesome. That's um, awesome. So yeah. And so now you're working on the series. So how many books do you are you supposed to be making it? So I turned the third one in uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I've got two more. This is going to be five, and then uh, and then we'll see where I go from there. I might want to do uh, young adult series after that, or some standalone novels. Um, but it's uh, they're they're not small. They take about a year to do. They're about a quarter million words a piece. Um, and so, yeah, this has just been an ongoing project. I try to do about one a year, but I also edit a bunch of uh, short story anthologies. I work with all kinds of writers. Um, you know, actually, there's something I, I meant to say during all the heavy metal stuff, is that there is a weird relationship, right, between heavy metal music and, and the whole literature of the imagination, fantasy, science fiction stuff. Um, in no small part, right, they're talking about Sabbath being inspired by horror films, but uh, Led Zeppelin's got this complex with Tolkien. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I remember you talked to Nicholas about Tolkien, so, uh, and he's hugely influential in my own work um, as well, even though I'm writing a different genre, or at least superficially a different genre. I think science fiction is all fantasy. Um, You're right. In some form <laughs> or other, you know. Uh, is the, genre dis the arguments about genre distinctions uh, between science fiction and fantasy and all the little subgenres are as annoying and obscure as the distinctions between metal genres. I don't understand them. <laughs> It's, it's such a popular panel item at conventions. They're, they're always like, what's well, urban fantasy? And I'm like, I, it's not, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, but uh, Led Zeppelin writes all these songs that touch on, on Middle Earth and stuff. And what's so interesting about that is uh, that they ended up making Lord of the Rings really popular with hippies in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was this huge boom, in no small part because my publisher's father, uh, Donald Walheim, published an unauthorized edition as mm. a paperback. Uh, there was some loophole in the way copyright law worked, and he was able to bootleg them, uh, basically, because Tolkien didn't want to publish them as a paperback. And so this cheap edition got published and got picked up by a bunch of science fiction and fantasy fans who were, uh, or who, and who are, a lot of them hippies and punks, um, and so on. And... So Tolkien caught on with the least likely people imaginable. It's so funny. Um, which is another kind of inversion here, right? Because um, the states, Tolkien world basically got a, like, it, it has a caste system in it, basically. It yeah, looks like it, it looks like medieval India or something. Sometimes, yeah. You know, and, and, but it is, he's so explicitly Catholic, too, right? Yeah. In, in, in the way that that's written. And he's an Oxford Don, right? He, it, it, He's the last person any of these people would read. And yeah. he becomes the underpinning for uh, the entire genre, really, because yeah. Lord of the Rings really uh, revolutionized the way we told epic fantasy mm. stories to the point where people complain about it now. You've got all these um, you know, activist writers who are talking about trying to get away from Tolkien's you know, shadow mm. and, his, uh, and his worldview and his world building, and they just, they just can't seem to shake it anyway. Yeah. There was a story that went around about orcs um, a couple, I think, like half a year ago or so, where this guy was talking about how the orcs were all this, uh, this horrific racist stereotype, um, you know, and I actually know that guy. Um, he was a guest lecturer at NC State, uh, the guy who told that particular story. But he, um, they just, they can't get away, can't get away from Tolkien. They keep trying to divorce fantasy from him. So did because he try to write a story where the orcs win or something? Like where he the wrote orcs a, a short story uh, where he conflated Bilbo Baggins with Senator Bilbo, uh, who was uh, an American senator who was a segregationist, um, and uh, it it was it was a strange like uh, satire piece. I, I I read it a while ago, so I'm a little fuzzy on the details of the story itself, but. <laughs> It's, it's, it's really emblematic of this way that people keep trying to chip Tolkien out mm. of the, uh, the canon, if you will, because so many people are aware of the fact that Tolkien is this religious, you know, sort of conservative figure. It was, I was talking to a writer at the last convention I was at, and I, just, I described Tolkien as conservative, and it, like, blew his mind. It's what? Like, not? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> The Return of the King? Like, what are you talking about, dude? He didn't, he didn't get it. 
And it's so bizarre to me because the people who are fantasy fans and who are metal fans to an extent, who are, are rock music fans, are these sort of marginal figures, right? If you've ever been to a science fiction convention, you'll, uh, I'm always, and I don't mean to sound, this is going to sound bad, but I'm always surprised that like, I don't see these people anywhere else, right? I, I go there and I'm like, where are you guys on Tuesday? They, um, they are these, these, you know, marginal, uh, people and I was one of them right I was this kid who didn't uh really fit in in school I was in a, I had a class of like 20 kids all the way up through eighth grade and by about third grade they mostly decided who their friends were and I was not most of their friends mm. and I think that's sort of the archetypal like fan person right um they might be you know marginalized for different reasons I was marginalized for being weird as opposed to um you know, uh, the, the, the canonical reasons people are marginalized in, in the 21st century, right? Uh, race, sex, behavior, you know, these sorts of things. Um, but, I, but that's the sort of person who is attracted to things like fantasy and to end like metal music too. Um, well, there's something in, in Lord of the Rings, the, the thing that saves, now I'm kind of joking, like I'm, I'm going over the top when I'm saying that his world is like, a, is like medieval India. He, there's something about, the, the great thing about Tolkien, which saves it and also makes it Christian, is that his main character is the littlest of these. Like, he doesn't, he talks about the loftiness of the elves and, the, and you know, and, and all these other characters, but the one who saves the day ends up being the smallest one. And so because of that, he fills his world. Like, he doesn't just, he doesn't just say, you know, it's like high, good, down, bad. Like, there's also this idea that, that, even at the lowest, even the smallest one can play a part and participate in the grand story. And so, right, and, and, I, and final redemptions in the hands of Gollum too, right? This yeah. this really twisted marginal figure, right? So I, I, I want to make sure that I apologize to my fellow uh, marginal nerd friends. Uh, <laughs> you know, we are all Gollum um, to a certain extent, and and that's that is the way that the world is, right? Mm. There's a part of us that is that sort of, yeah. you know. That, that that wretched marginal, you know, character, um, and that's I think part of what uh, attracts everyone to Tolkien, right? Especially you know the fan community, right? Mm -hmm. Is that there is still that that space? There's a little bit left, you know, not tied off from the fringe, right? Um, is even Gollum, right? It is the the pity of Bilbo that rules the fate of many, right? He spares this 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 wretched thing. Mm. Um, So yeah, it's it's but it's it is it's 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 strange to me that the the margins of society right centered this very uh, Christian you know fantasy story. Rock and roll helped do that, mm. um, and it brought all these people because I know people who don't like. I was at a party once and someone uh, uh, said that they had to stop seeing their kid because he dabbled in Christianity. Um, they were, they were practicing witch. It was it was the most upside down sentence I ever heard. Um, <laughs> it was it was so bizarre. But they were all um, they were all Wiccans. Yeah, it's like he's Wiccan. hiding a Bible under his under his pillow, you know. And apparently he was. Um, <laughs> and um, but they also were talking about how they really liked Tolkien about twenty minutes earlier, right? Mm. And I didn't bother to point this out because it was late and I didn't want to be in a party with all these witches anymore. No, sorry, um, right, with witches. It was, uh, conventions are like this. Uh, there are an inordinate number of, of uh, witches who are involved in science fiction and fantasy writing. I don't take them seriously. I, someone tells me that they're a practicing witch. I think, oh, right, and I play Dungeons and Dragons sometimes too. Um, <laughs> It's all made up, anyway. It's, it's all made up. It's, it's all a weird modern invention. It, yeah. it, it the very earliest mid nineteenth century, you know. Yeah. Gosh, it's so silly. Uh, but they, there are so many of them, and it's this weird reactionary, goofy thing. Um, but they are also attracted to the same stories, and so they run in these circles. Yeah, I, you know, I it's funny because I'm I'm working I've been working on a story um like an origin story of Santa Claus for a few years and um I uh, I bought I saw that um more Grant Morrison had published a a graphic novel called Klaus um 
And so I got it and I knew kind of knew what I was going to get, what I was going to get, you know, but it was just so hilarious to see this desire to make Santa Claus into like a pagan figure into like a completely pagan non-Christian figure. You know, I think Christmas isn't mentioned once. They always say Yuletide or whatever. And, and it was like, it was just so, I mean, I knew, I, I should, I knew that's what it was going to be, but it was just still shocking to like read the entire graphic novel and to realize, you know, he's like taking psychedelics and he's seeing, uh, he's seeing, um, what are they called? Machine elves or whatever. And like all this stuff and his clockwork elves. And I'm like, Oh my goodness, this is nuts. This guy's crazy. <laughs> it's so strange. It, this is the same thing though. with like misappropriating these symbols, right? Is, I, I don't know if they're afraid to play the thing straight or if they don't like the the original version of the myth because they have an antipathy for the faith or whatever but there's a there it, there's this strange current that they can't quite not use those stories right um like look at uh, like look at how many king arthur adaptations come out right without without the church without it's like every single Every single, every single medieval movie, you know, never has Christianity in it, which is just bizarre, which is like... Unless it's an evil Catholic movie. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I do like Lady Hawk. That is a good movie. But um, actually, they do mention God frequently in that one. Never okay. mind. That movie gets a pass. Yeah, uh, and that's why all the King Arthur movies suck. They just stink to high heaven because they don't have the grail. They don't have everything that makes King Arthur King Arthur, you know, and, the, and, and then when you have the grail and you have, you know, the, the feast of Pentecost and all these things, then Merlin as a shady kind of ambiguous figure makes sense. But if you're in a medieval world where there's no Christianity, then it's like, okay, well, Merlin's just a wizard because we've seen wizards in Harry Potter and we've seen wizards everywhere. They don't, they don't matter because they all wear pointy hats and we all know what they are. But it's like, <coughs> sorry, in a Christian world, then you would have, then Merlin could actually play an interesting role. And as this kind of strange, ambiguous character, this kind of marginal figure that is, we don't know which side he's on. We're not sure what his intentions are. It's like there you've got interesting stuff. But without that, it's just nonsense. Yeah, but there's this weird tendency to just denature everything, right? So there's not even a margin anymore. So nobody can fit any. These stories are so sanitized, especially at the Hollywood level. They don't really know what to, to do with any of it. And All it, right. Well, it's our job now, then. It's our job to tell the good stories. That's it. Yeah, that's the truth. I, I, hope, uh, I hope someone, you know, I hope, I hope we're not alone in that. So. Well, we're, you know, I think we're, it's, it's growing. I think we're going to see more and more. And uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully we can just encourage people to, to, to learn the good stories and to tell the good stories. Um, that's, one of, that's one of the things I'm trying to do, that's for sure, to try to get you know, like even co connect with people like you with Nicholas and start to connect with people that are trying to, to tell the stories in the, in a good way, you know, even in the weird stuff, you can have the weird stuff, just have it in the right place. And it's fine. Like it's totally Yeah. Fine. I will say that's what I hope I'm doing. Right. In, 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 to go back to the St. Christopher story, that is my name, right. Which is what freaked me out about the story when you, when you told it in the video, I hope that, my works in some way because they're not explicitly christian books even though to the degree the lord of the rings is they're when i was writing them i thought i was just writing science fiction stories right? and i don't know exactly what it is i am writing but i hope that some people will come to that and then come through them maybe to something more meaningful hmm. um and i hope that i entertain people telling stories yeah all right christopher it was really great to talk to you and i'll have to think more about have you metal not too much I can send you a couple suggestions if you want. Uh, <laughs> I'll at least send you after forever. I think that one's pretty safe. So. That's the song. That's that song by Black Sabbath. The the, yes, the, the, the Christian, Christian one. one. All right, I'll listen. To, I mean, I've listened to heavy metal before. Like I've heard it. I'm not just never been a fan. I, it's not like I'm not saying that to be like uh, to to look virtuous. I, I you I was a punk rock. I was a punk rock guy. You know, I, that's what I was listening to. So it's not it's not a yeah, not a virtue right. signal. It's just. It's just kidding. Just not, it's just the thing about the, 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 there's the metal crowd. They just also have this like hermetic thing where the metal fans, they kind of, they know each, I don't know. They like know, they can tell each other or they, 
kind of have this weird thing where they know each other. I it's the subgenre thing. They're mutually mm. estranged from one another. Uh, there's a weird Tower of Babel thing that's gone on where like black metal people don't talk to power metal people. <laughs> And they only agree on the old stuff, and even yeah. then, not all the time. Um, it's it's strange. Anyway. All right. So it was great to talk to you, and uh, hopefully, way. I'm hoping that if I have time to, to to read your novels, we can have a, another conversation after that. Uh, I would love to. I could send you a copy if you want. Sure. Yeah. Great. And I wish you all the best on your your new wedding, and uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, a, a new life starting. That sounds like an adventure on its own. Thank you very much. All right. And thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Hope you enjoyed this discussion with Christopher Rocchio. Please check out his books. I'm going to put links to his writing in the description so you can see that. There are a lot of things coming up very soon. I'm going to be in Seattle in the month of May. First week of May, so the weekend of May 2nd, I will be speaking at the Shared Inheritance Conference there. Details are coming, but mark that on your schedule. I'm also going to be giving a week-long carving workshop from the 4th to the 9th in Seattle. So if you're interested in that, spending a whole week, we carve, we talk, we have a lot of fun uh, discussing all kinds of subjects. Stay tuned to that because details for how to, uh, to sign up for that will be coming very soon. I will also be in Hartford, Connecticut in the month of June, which will be the first week of June from the 31st of May to the 6th of June. Um, and usually the same thing there, a whole week of carving and hanging out and talking. So stay tuned to that also for details how to sign up for that. And uh, yeah, so a new video coming up very soon, guys. Thanks for your support and I'll talk to you very soon.